Welcome to our Lacai's uh, YouTube channel. We are very pleased to have today Professor Efraín McLean uh, in this interview for our Lacai channel. So Professor McLean has been one of the pioneers in the MIS field. That's the reason we wanted to bring him as our first interview and in this uh, in this channel. So uh, thank you, Professor McLean, to agree with, to be with us today. I appreciate that so much. You're certainly welcome. I look forward to this opportunity to talk about a field which I feel very passionate about, which is information systems and what it means not only in the United States, but in Latin America and around the world. Okay. Uh, I want to start with uh, one first question that we, we wanted to get from you. Um, we wanted to know how could you uh, define information systems according to your view? Well, that uh, we labor under the view that somehow we have a separate discipline. And that's been very difficult because actually in the uh, 1970s we were struggling because what is information systems? And we had conferences in computer science that were done by ACM. And we had uh, uh, conferences on uh, operations research and management science that was done by Tim's and Orson Tim's. But neither were really our field. It wasn't the mathematics of, of, of information, and it wasn't the engineering and the computer science of it. And so that's why we said that we really need to think about that. Uh, whether it's the union or the intersection of those two siblings, that we actually have a field which has to do with not so much the construction of artifacts, but the application of artifacts. The idea of taking technology, information technology, and making it relevant to whether it's business or government or currently I'm working in the healthcare area, and that there, so, so it is based on technology. You have to have a master of the technology, but you're not so much for creating the artifacts in technology like database systems or operating systems or mobile systems, but you're talking about how they're used and useful to, to society. So that's what it is. And it was interesting in terms of that, uh, in terms of that community, that uh, we were saying, we, we see these programs growing up, and that, uh, but we're not really well received. It's been difficult. And in each of our universities, we're kind of, what is that field they're into? What are they teaching? And do they even deserve a place in our community, in our, uh, our, our faculty? And so, uh, and actually, I was active in Orsa Tim's, which is Management uh, Science and Research, uh, which, but I wasn't comfortable because I'm not a mathematician. We were meeting in Denver, Colorado in 1979. And we all were lamenting that we have uh, all over in, in ones and twos and threes in universities. It's not clear that we really have a recognition. And we have no meeting or conference where we can get together and make this happen. And so I and they said, you know, we've been complaining about this for two or three or four years. Let's do something about it. So I proposed, I said, there were some people with me in this meeting in Colorado. Will you come if I host a meeting at UCLA next spring in 2000, I mean, in 1980? And, they, and, I, and he said, if, if, if you pay your way to come, I will make sure we will host you when you get there. And we will reach out. And I said, in fact, think of everyone you can think of who is notable in the information uh, field in the United States and, and let's, let's, let's have them all come. And so they decided we would have a meeting. And, and when, given that call in a country the size of the United States, guess how many people we identified? 35. Wow. And actually, it's about 40. And we invited all 40 or 42. 35 of them came. Uh, I, if all their names you would recognize instantly in terms of their reputation. And there was a reporter from a technical uh, publication that uh, came by one day. She said, this is amazing. I write about what's happening in the information of the field. And everyone I've ever written about is in this room. <laughs> and so the, in May of 1980, we had a tiny group of people that believed in information system as a field. And we want to make it happen. And so we agreed that we need a meeting. And so that was the origin of ISIS. At that time, we only called it the uh, Conference on Information Assistance because we had no vision yet of being international. And we agreed 
that let's have a, a meeting. In fact, it will not be computer science. It will not be management science. It will be information systems, or ICT. And we had, we planned, and here's an issue that many of you wondered, why do you have ISIS in December? In most places in the northern hemisphere, it's cold and uh, it's dark, and, uh, and it often interferes with the Christmas holidays. Why do you do it? And the answer was, in May of, of, of 1980, we said, we don't want to lose momentum. We want to bring this community together. And so how can we do it by having our first meeting this same year? Well, what's the farthest away from May in this year? It's December. And for that reason, we've had for the last 35 years our meetings in December. Uh, and so that uh, it was held at the Wharton School, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we had 135 people in attendance. And uh, we thought that this is the beginning of bringing together, that was both uh, faculty as well as doctoral students, people that were just beginning their studies, and that uh, uh, it was successful. And we uh, uh, had a number of, of, of pioneering papers, and, and uh, some that are still quoted, that first meeting, uh, CIS-1, and, pa and papers uh, that in fact were referred to. And so we said, you know, maybe we called it a, a, a CIS-1, is there a 2? And so the following year, I agreed to be the chair in Cambridge, Mass, co-chaired with Jack Lockhart. And so this was the beginning of ISIS, not the thing that's the terrible things that are happening in <laughs> the Middle East, but the international conference, what we now call it. By the way, we added the I to change the name about three or four years later, when we had truly became international and no longer were just in the United States, we had our first meeting in Copenhagen, Denmark, and as now we've been all around the world. So that uh, that second meeting, we thought, uh, will be in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is in the north, and it can be cold, and it turns out that the uh, weekend before the conference, they had the worst snowstorm ever in the history of Boston. It, uh, it closed the airport for 31 hours because of the snow. Uh, we People were stranded all over. I spent the night in Newark, New Jersey, waiting for a plane to get out of Newark into Boston. Uh, the doctor consortium uh, was snowed in. They had a tow truck to pull the bus to get it out of the uh, doctor consortium site. And we said, it looks like ISIS will not continue. This is such a blow that, that no one will show. We won't have a program. And that, therefore, our, our gallant and great, uh, great uh, uh, plan for a future for information systems is killed by the weather. But actually, uh, people started coming in Sunday night and Monday morning. And by Monday morning, more than two-thirds of the people who signed up were there, and we said, so the conference is not Sunday to Tuesday night, it'll be Monday to Wednesday, and it'll be there from Monday noon to Wednesday afternoon, uh, a three-hour, four-hour delay. Every single one of the speakers arrived, and we said, this endorsement of the idea that was so important that you took extraordinary steps to get to Boston in this snowstorm proves to us that this is a discipline, a career, a, a, a faculty that in fact will sustain. And of course now we're going around the world and we have a thousand plus students. So that, so that gives you an idea of we're in the background of the field and how to this day we think about, we study things like mobility, like the Internet of Things, like the cloud, like uh, analytics, etc. All of those are applications of technology, which is our field. The second thing I would say, not only we have a, a uh, I think, a, a, a strong tradition now, but the second is that even after we started uh, ISIS, and then later on AIS, which was in uh, the early 90s, about uh, 10, 12 years later, those two initiatives were really in response to we still are not getting the recognition in our schools, and that we need to reinforce that. And so that uh, 
one of the comments someone made, in American history, when we had the American Revolution, there was a question, this, these fledgling colonies in America were fighting against the very powerful English throne. And so therefore, they did not have the recognition, sort of like us, feeling beleaguered, feeling challenged. And so, as a famous phrase that they, one of the patriots said, if we don't hang together, we will hang separately. <laughs> and we thought about that, that if we have colleges and universities that don't respect us or recognize our work or don't really care whether we're even there, we're going to have to work together. And I say this because I've seen other factories of finance and behavioral science or accounting that the, the, the faculty don't get along. They tend to fight each other. They tend to be uh, uh, very uh, uh, competitive. And, and so one of the things, the second thing I would say about our field is I believe there is a great sense of mutual respect and care for one's colleagues and genuinely like to get together to share their research and, 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 and uh, a revel in the success of one's colleagues' research as opposed to being feeling threatened or complained or, or that. So therefore, those dimensions of, in fact, feeling that we've now had uh, three, to, three going on four decades of building the field, uh, we're still not huge. One study I saw a few years ago said, how many IS professors are there around the world? The whole world, what, six billion people? Yeah. The number was about 9,000, the entire world. And so anyway, so that's, so therefore, but it is, whether it's around uh, AIS, whether it's around ISIS, that, that it's a community, I think, that cares about each other, that wants to support each other. And that's why, I think, from AIS's standpoint, uh, there's such a commitment to make sure that we grow communities in Latin America, South America. And the reason why, when we e even named AIS, we talked about it was the Americas, Amsis of the Americas, and that, therefore, we have a, uh, the, you might say, First world, second world, third world, etc. Europe and, and, and Africa, and, and then uh, Americas, and then Asia. And that model is to make sure that we recognize for the uh, entire world that this is a world phenomena, and therefore we want to support programs around the world to make sure that uh, all of us can share the benefits of this. So. A long answer to a short yeah, question. Yeah, very, very, very interesting because it, it comes just uh, with the second question we had. It was what, what, what were the major points in your development or your career? So. You mentioned I'd been around for a long time. That is really a long time. By the way, you can hear we're technology. We're next to the airport, so the yeah. planes come by. But um, that uh, I, uh, my degree was in engineering, and so I. Uh, went into the Army, I think, uh, Army Ordnance, to, uh, which is uh, the, the technology side of, uh, of the Army. And I got out of the Army, and I went, went to Procter & Gamble making soap. I was the manufacturer in, in New York City that made soap, because it's Procter & Gamble, and so, the, uh, and then also we made some other uh, 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 products for the home. And they said, we want to introduce computing into tech. And when was this all? This was in I went to Dr. Gimlin in 1959. And so they said, we want to have an application. And so they uh, took me from the New York to corporate headquarters in Cincinnati. And, and I went back. And our first project was a 1,200 man plant payroll on a 4K card machine in 1962. 4,000 positions of storage is all we had. And the machine actually, you could buy one that had 16,000, four times 4,000. I would have killed to be able to have space of all 16,000 positions of storage over the 4,000 <laughs> we had to use. Card machine, no tapes, no disk drives. And uh, we, we built that and installed that in Procter & Gamble in 1960. So my students figure out that's uh, 54 years ago. And that some will say, well, well, I wasn't even born. This yeah. friend said, hell, my father wasn't even born. born. And so, so I started and so, saw over the years, etc. as, uh, for instance, 
uh, we, we, we uh, you may know the uh, original computing called electronic uh, tablet, e, 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 uh, e, electronic tablet equipment or electronic, uh, uh, what is the, the, ADP, anyway, different words but was in fact very primitive technology. We had that first computer but we started using uh, punch cards and wires. Oh. That, that they're, if, if they call it a breadboard. You take a wire to here and a wire to there, and that's how you program by these number of wires going over here. And so that uh, we, I, so I started out with a uh, IBM 405 and 602, which were these breadboards of wires that you manually put in, then driving the printer. And so we were very pleased to get that first computer, IBM 1401. And so three years later, IBM made a major uh, innovation, which is announcing the IBM 360 line in April of, of uh, 1964, 63, 64, I sat in a room where they announced the entire new architecture which is, it has uh, come to this day. It was combining uh, a character machine with a word machine in, in the single IBM line. And so I, we introduced that at Procter & Gamble. And so I said, you know, a lot of exciting things are happening. Maybe I should think about doing graduate work. And in 1965, I said, what university has a program in information systems in 1965? And there weren't many, but I decided on MIT. And I went in MIT Sloan School, not the computer science department, but in the management school to be an MIS major. And so I uh, got my master's in 67, and then um, I studied my doctorate in 69, so another two years. And it was interesting because I'm now involved with health information technology, health IT. It started then. My dissertation at, at, in Boston was at the Leahy Clinic, which was a very prestigious, uh, multi-specialty uh, physicians, 100 physicians, 25 medical specialties. And they decided they could use technology, not because of a government grant, but they invested out of their own money, their own pockets, to pay for what I helped develop, which is a computer based medical history system yeah. in 1968, which was my dissertation. And when I finished, I was looking for a job. I then left Boston and went to uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. I was there for 18 years and got the healthcare bug. And so in, in a physician at UCLA and I created a MIS program, Medical Information Systems, where you got a MBA and an MPH, a Master of Public Health, in one combined degree, very successful, went on for a number of years. I did some other things, and then in 1987, I was offered an endowed position at Georgia State. I moved from California, and uh, have been there for almost 30 years. And But as over that time, I continued my work with Bill DeLone, who was a doctoral student of mine at UCLA, when we, when we began our, our research on uh, MIS success, or the the independent variable, the dependent variable. And so starting at 87, when he became my doctoral student, uh, to when now we've uh, had uh, some three decades of cooperation, which you perhaps know of as the DeLone, yes. my student, and McLean success model. Excellent. Thank you so much for your nice stories about it. So, uh, what could you say to the students and faculty in Latin America, basically, so uh, they could be interested in joining well, the community, the MIS community? When I share my story of having been in the uh, IT interface from 54 years and seeing what's happened in terms of technology, etc. For instance, when I was at UCLA, Len Kleinhawk, a colleague of mine at UCLA, first internet transmission from UCLA to Stanford. And so that uh, these were really monumental events. They said, well, you've seen so many things. Obviously, all of that that you see means that therefore most of it's happened. And I said, absolutely not. Everything I've seen, as exciting as it's been, is just the beginning. If you know mathematics, the first derivative is growth. The, exec the second derivative is accelerated growth. And, it, and our field is accelerating at an accelerating pace. And so I tell them, if you're looking for things that are happening, whether it's around social media, whether it's around uh, uh, the uh, uh, internet of things, a whole bunch of things, all of these things, et cetera, are on 
just the, the, the as, as this talk, your question about why should you be interested in the in IT, I, in IS field, and I, I argue that number one, that in spite of my long time in the uh, field, and many things have happened, many, many more things are ahead of us, and so therefore, the, the idea that uh, it's growing at an accelerating pace, and so therefore, there are many, many more things ahead of us that in fact we could have even not dreamed of in the past. So therefore, that development, that rapid growth, those opportunities, and beyond business applications in government and healthcare and agriculture, a number of areas which will profit from technology, and so you can specialize in a variety of application areas that are attractive. So number one, many opportunities for all kinds of teaching and research. Number two, because of the fact for many, many years, IS departments and universities were not necessarily had the same respect as some of the other traditional disciplines did. And so you had to kind of uh, do even a better job to prove that you were equal to the other departments of finance, accounting, and marketing, etc. And so I think the, uh, our field has developed a tradition, a culture of helping each other in, in, in AIS itself. The idea was that therefore this should be globally and we should have an Americas, which is why we're here in the Americas Conference. We would have a European presence and an Asian presence. So, so therefore, that, uh, and that's what we're so excited when AMSIS went to uh, Lima, Peru, and therefore, that to work, and, and also Ocapulco we had earlier, and now we're going to Cancun, and making sure that the Americas doesn't mean North America, that means throughout the uh, Americas, and I think that's an, an indicative of our culture and why if people in South and, and, and America wish to become, they will be joining that community, which we believe is a supportive one, and, uh, and therefore we can help you uh, to be able to be successful in your own countries. Thank you, very interesting. So uh, we, we will ask our community in Latin America to be part of the MIS. You know? So uh, our last question is, uh, According to your vision, so what do you think uh, the MIS field will be in the future? Well, uh, it's you know always dangerous to predict the future, and and who would have thought if even ten years ago we've seen the things that have happened, and that uh, we a hint of now, for instance, uh, drones delivering everything to our homes, cars that drive without autonomous vehicles, without any drivers, etc., uh, and that. Uh, uh, so clearly, and then uh, when we, some of the new developments, the Internet of Things, that, uh, were, you know, uh, when I go to open the refrigerator door, I said, stop that, fatty, you don't need a snack. <laughs> you know, or, or the dark side, where that therefore, now that, you know, I'm working in hospitals, that all of the uh, medical devices are controlled by computer software, right? So now uh, hackers are coming in and said, you think that you're in an MRI device getting it there? We have control of the software. We're going to elevate the, uh, the charge and fry you while you're inside. And so therefore, the Internet of Things is that therefore if they talk to each other so you can get the benefits, therefore the dark side is they can in fact be compromised and hacked into. And so therefore things, that, you know, going back into your home and it's now fighting you, your refrigerator, your oven, and all of a sudden, upper turns up to 800 degrees. Your, your the the locks all open automatically, and so therefore understanding both the benefits and the and the threats of these new technologies is, is very and and lastly that uh, very very relevant. Delta went out of business last Monday. Oh, they went out of business. They stopped flying because of a computer glitch. One, one server at the front end of 6,000 servers they have that manage everything from flight scheduling to passengers to, to reservations, etc. And it, it overheated, caught fire. Not a big deal. You have a backup, right? They, for that particular server, they had neglected to program a, back, a backup. And it cascaded. It backed up, so actually burned out the incoming power from Georgia power and went downstream and so therefore uh, thousands of flights cancel computer glitch they said but it was really had we designed them carefully enough so that not just uh, uh, 
80 percent, 90 percent, that 100 percent of all the servers had a backup. And so that cascaded. They were down Tuesday, Wednesday, and only barely restored it. And so that loss is in tens of millions of dollars. And what if the next crash is in our power grid or in our water supply? So if you ask me one area that we need to spend a lot of attention on in the future is security by all kinds of things, including human error and hackers and, and criminals and state cybersecurity, where in fact we're seeing a huge transfer of technology from the West to China. The speaker this morning mentioned, you wonder why the Chinese uh, new airplanes look like American airplanes? Because they stole all of the dr uh, 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 drawings and, and uh, doc to create them. He said, not only do they look exactly like the planes they copied from us, but they each uh, got going sooner because our procurement process is lengthy and the Chinese, in fact, government tells them, you build this. And so the whole idea of cybersecurity, of, of, of safeguarding how our water is, how our electricity is, how our roads are, etc. that study alone is one that's going to uh, devote a lot of attention to in the future. And so we, and I think we almost uniquely, because it's, it's an intersection of technology and people, investments and infrastructure that therefore we probably more than computer science more than the others are, are, are really positioned to address that one particular thing and as well as uh, a series of applications so I think the future will hold uh, the opportunity for things undreamed of for the betterment of, of mankind uh, but also there is a huge thing we have to be aware of that in fact the dark side also has some potential uh, cataclysmic results if it's misused. So that's what I, so I'm, I'm positive but guarded <laughs> for the yeah. future. Thank you so much, Professor McLean. It has been a pleasure for us to have you here and in our first you know, YouTube channel. So we in La Caes are, are very glad to have this program with you. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. It's thank been a pleasure so myself. Thank you very much.